Okay, before we start, we would like to announce the launch of our Patreon. The link is in the description. The majority of the documentaries we make are a censored version. We will be releasing the uncut versions on the Patreon, as well as exclusive content that will probably not reach YouTube for some time. This story is censored, but if you wish to see the unedited version, sign up to the Patreon. Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. Today, they released a new item. These HUD Tech Military Cargos. These is fire. A lot of you don't know how to dress these days and you know it. Some of you are old heads, out of touch, and don't know what to buy, so get these. Also, if you're not one to wear shorts in the summer, these joints will provide you with some style. Just make sure you got on some good feats though. These are $18, light bread. Get yours, they have them in different colors. We got ours already. Between at least August 2015 and January 2016, Chulo was the leader of a drug trafficking crew operating in and around Arthur Avenue and 180th Street in the Bronx. Chulo and his crew, the Arthur Avenue crew, sold crack and cocaine outside buildings on the Arthur Avenue block and used violence and threats of violence to prevent rival drug dealers from nearby Hughes Avenue, the Hughes Avenue crew, from taking away their customers and profits. In October and November 2015, Chulo and his crew engaged in four back-and-forth shootings with members of the Hughes Avenue crew, including rival dealer David Rivera. This violence culminated on November 24, 2015, when Chulo murdered Rivera in a parking lot. During this time, there wasn't many other young guys doing drills on Arthur, so Chulo was looked at by their rivals, Hughes Avenue, as reckless. They were older and getting money much more sophisticatedly. The Hughes Avenue crew were also known as the Flow Organization, located in the vicinity of 178th Street and Hughes Avenue in the Bronx. This beef was more than about drugs and turf and dates back to as early as 2008. It was shortly before 3.30 a.m. on a Saturday that year, the boxer, Ronnie Vargas, who was 20, was shot in the torso while sitting in a car after he and some friends got into a dispute with strangers at a bodega on Clinton Avenue in the Bronx, the police said. As an amateur, Mr. Vargas had won the Golden Gloves junior middleweight title in 2005, 2006 and 2007 before turning professional, winning all of his eight pro fights, six of them by knockouts. He last fought about two weeks prior to his death in New Jersey, where he knocked out his opponent in the third round. He had all the tools to be a real good fighter, he said. Most of Mr. Vargas's pro fights were preliminary bouts, coming on cards with more established fighters, and at least one was in Madison Square Garden. He showed promise as a boxer early on and started training when he was eight or nine, said one of his brothers, who added that Ronnie had dropped out of high school to pursue boxing. Ronnie Vargas's day revolved around being fit for the ring, and he would train in the gym at the Police Athletic League on Longwood Avenue in the Bronx until 7 or 8 p.m. Early in his days, he trained at the Webster PAL. He was already special, he had the moves, he had everything. All his life he dreamed of being a champion. Early Saturday morning, Ronnie Vargas went to the bodega at Clinton Avenue and 179th Street with five friends. They got into an argument with a group of two men and two women they did not know, the police said. Allegedly, the dispute started because the women were flirting with Mr. Vargas, who was sitting in a Honda outside the store. When Mr. Vargas drove off with his friends, the other group followed them in a light-colored automobile and cut them off at Hughes Avenue and East 178th Street, blocking Mr. Vargas's car. One of the men in the pursuing group got out of the car with a gun, pistol whipped Mr. Vargas in the driver's seat, and then shot him, the police said. Mr. Vargas drove in reverse, sideswiping other cars before getting out and collapsing on the street, the police said. He was pronounced dead at St. Barnabas Hospital. As news of the shooting spread, Mr. Vargas's family and neighbors gathered outside the Broadway Mini Market on West 152nd Street, one of his favorite neighborhood hangouts, where the memorial began to grow. One friend was in the passenger seat when Mr. Vargas was shot. The friend held Mr. Vargas outside the vehicle after he was shot. I think I got hit because I can't breathe no more, Mr. Vargas told his friend. A man, 10 years Ronnie Sr., would be arrested for the murder. There was different details or an alternate story as to what happened. Allegedly, there was an angry confrontation between the boxer and the man. Reportedly, the man disapproved of a romantic relationship between the victim and his own niece. Another story was that he was just dancing with some females, and one of them got angry and killed him. 
Either way, they linked the murder to guys from Hughes. This would create friction, at least for some who harbored the area. Being that the crews were in close quarters, the beef had more personal dynamics. Not everyone hated each other, and some people from opposing sides intermingled or sold drugs with one another. We will try to make this clear for you all. Let's just start with a little overview before we get into the breakdown of the individual crimes. The supplier of the flow organization on Hughes was Raman. Raman supplied the organization with large quantities of a particular type of heroin that he branded with the words, flow stamped on each bag. Tekka and her stepbrothers, Jose and John, served as lieutenants or deputies in the flow organization at various times during its operation. In turn, they used members of the Crips gang as retail dealers of their heroin. Those Crips, the Rolling Thirties, controlled this area, as well as the vicinity one block away, Rayway, the Monterey Houses. They were charged in their own separate indictment, which we will talk about in a later video. One of the Flow organization's retail dealers, Najin, was also charged in this case, but primarily for the out-of-town situation. The Flow organization was responsible for the distribution of dozens of kilograms of heroin in two areas. First, the area around 178th Street and Hughes, and second, Rutland, a place in Vermont. The Flow organization likely sold heroin in Rutland, because it could be sold for more money there. Indeed Vermont was an epicenter of the recent heroin epidemic, and the governor of Vermont declared that the state was in a full-blown heroin crisis in 2014. Lower-ranking members of the Flow organization recruited local addicts to sell drugs on their behalf, commonly paying them with heroin. So, let's do a little background on Raman. Raman was born on August 16, 1964, in Puerto Rico. Throughout his childhood and early adolescence, Raman witnessed a persistent situation of domestic violence in his home. Raman's father was a highly abusive and very violent man, who would beat his wife mercilessly, and at times hit his children as well. The day Raman was due to be born, Raman's father beat Raman's mother because he wanted her to iron his shirt before they went to the hospital. On another occasion, Raman's father beat Raman's mother over the head with a pipe in front of Raman and his siblings. Ordinary family meals and outings would devolve into instances of abuse, and the police were called on numerous occasions to prevent Raman's father from beating his wife. He often interceded to separate his parents. Some nights, Raman and his siblings would be woken by their parents fighting. Other nights, when Raman's mother was most fearful, she would sleep in the bathroom to escape the abuse. Over the years, as the abuse escalated, Raman's mother became increasingly withdrawn and isolated, and slept on a mattress on the floor to escape the wrath of her husband. Victimized and hardened by years of abuse, Raman's mother did not provide Raman and his siblings with the love and warmth a mother would typically give her children. When Raman was 15, his parents divorced. There was shared custody of their children at first, but their relationship remained strained, and, on one occasion, Raman's father struck Raman's mother. The police were called to remove Raman's father from Raman's mother's home, and Raman's mother was granted a restraining order. Raman's father abused Raman as well. On occasion, he would hit Raman. He would also consistently insult Raman and make disparaging remarks to humiliate him, telling him, for example, that he was good for nothing, and that he was nobody. At age 15, amidst his parents' divorce, Raman turned toward marijuana and cocaine to self-medicate. This early drug use was the first step on what has become a decades-long path of substance abuse. Raman became an everyday marijuana smoker and frequently abused cocaine through age 23. He also abused crack cocaine for one year when he was approximately 22 and has a history of snorting heroin. Prior to his current arrest, Raman was abusing oral opioids, taking four Percocet per day to achieve a euphoric high. As he started abusing drugs, Raman also became increasingly truant from school and began spending time on the street and hanging out with a bad crowd. At age 17, Raman dropped out of 10th grade. Two years after her divorce from Raman's father, Raman's mother fled alone to New York to find peace. Around the same time, Raman's father remarried in Puerto Rico. At age 18, Raman thus found himself and his siblings quite alone in Puerto Rico, living on their own in Raman's mother's old house and having to fend for themselves. Two years later, Raman and his younger brother went to live with their mother in New York, however, Raman's mother soon remarried and kicked her sons out of her home. As a result of the abuse she had suffered, Raman's mother had become more isolative and withdrawn and did not want her sons, who were using drugs, to create problems for her. 
Eventually, Raman's mother severed relationships with all her children. This was a very difficult period for Raman and his siblings. Raman again fell in with a rough crowd, he began abusing cocaine daily and also started abusing crack cocaine. Shortly thereafter, Raman began engaging in criminal conduct to sustain his addiction, which led to a series of arrests and convictions. In 1990, Raman was sentenced to three to six years' as imprisonment for attempted possession of a controlled substance. He was paroled after serving three years and spent four more years under supervision without incident. From that time up until his current arrest, Raman had few encounters with the law and all stemmed from possession of marijuana for personal consumption. Over time in the streets of New York would propel him to become the main distributed on Hughes, as we spoke earlier. He would get connected to a man named Neil, who would be his supplier. Neil had his own situation and that's a different story. Anyway, on March 6, 2010, defendant's brother, Jonathan Santiago, got into an altercation with Tide at Rini's pool hall in the Bronx, during which Tide slashed Jonathan's face. Several months later, in the early morning hours of September 11, 2010, defendant, Jonathan, and Tide all were at the pool hall once again. Allegedly, at some point that evening, defendant and his brother left the pool hall and went to one of the apartment buildings from which they sold heroin in order to retrieve the firearm. They then returned with their drug supplier, Ramon Raman, to the area of the pool hall. There, the two brothers confronted Tide shortly after he left the pool hall. Jonathan stated to Tide, remember what you did to my face, and then instructed defendant to shoot Tide. Defendant opened fire and shot and killed Tide. It was said that he passed a gun off to a female, Willows A, John, and possibly another female got back in the car with Raman and drove off. The female who had the gun kept it moving on foot down Jerome Avenue. People were scared of and respected the defendant after the shooting. Raman was getting to know defendant and his brother and had became closer with defendant and his brother after the murder. Although Oze was the shooter, his brother, John, was mistakenly arrested and charged with the murder. He would be sentenced to 13 years. He would be out the game from 2011. He still participated in the organization through phone calls. Meanwhile, Oze became the boss of the drug organization, at which point the amount of flow heroin that Oze sold increased. His former rivals no longer sold flow heroin on East 178th Street after the murder, and Raman's only managers following the killing were defendant and his siblings. Before this, Raman had sold flow heroin to defendant's organization, as well as to independent random people and other blocks close to Hughes before the murder. Now, Oze was his primary distributor. On or about August 29, 2012, one of the addicts who had been recruited by the Flow organization sold Flow heroin to Blanchard. Blanchard and his partner, Ginger Springer, took the heroin they had bought and then went to sleep. Hours later, Springer woke up, she took their baby daughter and left the hotel room. Later that afternoon, Springer placed their daughter on Blanchard's chest to wake him up, as was their routine. But Blanchard was unresponsive. He had died from his ingestion of Flow heroin in his sleep. Despite Blanchard's death, members of the Flow organization continued to sell heroin in Vermont. Following Blanchard's death, Cheka traveled to Vermont to assist in the organization's distribution of heroin there. Back in the Bronx, by 2015, the crew were in a string of shootouts with the likes of the Arthur Avenue crew, as we stated earlier in the video. At the time, Chulo was pretty much the most reckless member from Arthur Avenue. Ruben Pizarro, a.k.a. Chulo, is a reputed member of the Notorious Bloods, one of the most violent gangs on the planet. He has a long rap sheet, arrested at least 30 times, including twice for attempted murder, but he was able to beat the charges every time. Cops say Pizarro terrorized the city with a one-man crime spree. Let us see what might have caused Chulo to take such a bizarre path. Ruben's short life had been bleak, unstable and dysfunctional existence from birth. His experiences in life and within his family were far from those of a stable, well-functioning family. While some people have tender memories of a healthy, happy, stable and secure childhood. His earliest memories of his home life revolve around his mother's drug use and drug dealing, the many men his mother brought home, and violence, both within and outside of his home. Domestic violence and substance abuse were commonplace and unexceptional in his life. His parents' relationship was blighted by physical, alcohol and drug abuse, psychological and emotional disturbances, incarceration and infidelity. He is the first of two children born to the union of his parent, having a brother about seven years younger. 
He also had two half-sisters, one being a couple years older. Chulo's pops reportedly died in 2011 at 73 years old. This could be attributed to the stress he endured during the time of his unity with Chulo's mother, according to Chulo. And Chulo's father, was a military veteran who believed in running a strict home. Ramanita, his mother, was reportedly the opposite of Antonio, as she was unstructured and permissive. Antonio was about 20 or more years older than Ramanita, which is a factor that contributed to their incompatibility. A persistent issue of conflict was Ramanita's drug abuse and drug dealing. Ramanita's drug use in the home triggered numerous physical and verbal altercations with Antonio. Another prickly issue was Ant's authoritarian style, which may have been suitable for the military, but did not transfer well to his relationship with Ramanita. Despite their interpersonal conflicts, Antonio and Ramanita tried for many years to make their relationship work. Apparently, the fact that their union produced two children made them feel compelled to stay together. Furthermore, each of them had a child before they met, and Antonio felt that their children should have a stable home. Ramanita did not know the whereabouts of her daughter's father, and so Antonio assumed that paternal role. When Ramanita became pregnant by Antonio in 1991, her daughter was three, and Antonio stuck with Ramanita throughout her pregnancy. Chulo was born on January 30, 1992. Chulo achieved his developmental milestones, sitting, walking, talking, and other things within normal limits. He was a good and quiet baby until age five or six. Upon his enrollment in kindergarten, at five years old, concerns about his learning ability emerged. He would get held back in first and second grade and be evaluated at age eight for emotional and learning disabilities. He was four years old when he first saw his mother selling drugs. She was selling the drugs in front of a chicken spot in Harlem. He also noticed that his mother kept drugs in the car, under the seat. Chulo was disturbed by the fights between his mother and father. The fighting was not only about drugs, but also about the men his mother was seeing. During his parents' fights, Chulo feared that he would be physically abused, and allegedly, his father beat him out of frustration. He faced an internal conflict, as he did not know whether to stay quiet about his mother's infidelities and drug activities, or to be a spy for his father. His mother would give him ice cream to dissuade him from revealing her activities, and his father would beat him if he did not tell on his mother. His mother's drug activity led to her arrest when he was four or five years old. The police raided his home, and when they found drugs they arrested his mother. This was Chulo's first significant impression of law enforcement in action. As his mother was taken away from him, he was left feeling unsafe and unsure about his survival. They took his mother, but failed to put in place any support or structure to protect him from the continued risk of maltreatment. After his mother was arrested, Chulo reportedly lived with his father for about three years. He was hopeful that his father would make him feel safe and assured about the future. He strived to please his father and began to feel like a daddy's boy. However, this desire for a secure bond with his father was not easy. Though he was agreeable to his father's preference for structure and rules. He noticed contradictions between his father's words and actions. Reportedly, his father had an arrest for drugs. Furthermore, his father talked about rules but was involved in illicit street gambling. He was a numbers man who had his own corner, Chulo stated. Another contradiction was father's affairs with several women. Despite the chaos and abuse that swirled around him, Chulo was expected to stay quiet and conform to his father's rules. His father was the one who gave him the name Chulo because of his looks but also wanted him to be a baseball star. He father would have him watch baseball games on TV over and over again. He hated doing that, but he feared being in disfavor of his father. Initially, Chulo was hopeful that his mother would return from prison as an improved person and that she and his father would settle into a normal family life. It did not take long, however, before his parents resumed their fighting with each other. He became tense whenever his parents began to argue as he knew it would lead to them fighting. He recalled one occasion his mother running down from their ninth floor apartment to the lobby naked after being beaten by his dad. He remembered when she would return home after being gone for a while, only to start an argument with his dad, so she could leave again. Chulo recalled at one time his mother got a job at the Bronx Zoo. This was encouraging, but the chaos at home made him feel trapped. He was anxious around her because of her reputation on the streets. He noticed that his mother had a lot of respect from the gangsters. He also noticed that his mother looked like a guy when she came home from prison. She was bulky. 
he was confused about his mother's identity and her role in his life, as she presented like she cared more about the streets than about caring for him. Even at home Chulo could not feel insulated from the bad influences of the street. At eight years old Chulo witnessed the shooting death of a man outside. He was at home looking through his window when he saw the deadly shooting. He was disturbed further by the reaction of his parents to the murder. His father asked him if he saw anything. Then, when he started to describe the shooter, his father slapped him and told him not to tell anybody what or who he saw. He slapped me to make sure never talk, Chulo remarked. His mother also pressured him to keep his mouth shut about the identity of the perpetrator. Chulo admits that he never disclosed the killer's identity, but he could not avoid seeing the killer in the community. He would get nervous whenever he saw the killer. At age 8, he felt his own death was near. In his attempt to feel safer at home, Chulo pleaded with his father to let his mother stay away from the house. However, his parents kept seeing each other. There were many times he caught his father crying. He felt his mother's affairs were taking a toll on his father's mental and physical health. Whenever his mother left the house, his father would punish him. He recalled that those times were the only times he would ask his father to put on a baseball game. That is how he would try to console him. He believed conditions at home would improve if his father stopped seeing his mother and choose another woman. He even told him about a woman in the building that he should get together with. His dad only wanted his mom. At 11 years old, Chulo felt compelled to intervene in one of his mother's affairs. He went to the home of one of his mother's boyfriends, named Casanova. I told the man to leave my mother alone, because he was causing a lot of grief for his family. Allegedly, Casanova shook his hand as if they had an agreement. Shortly after, Chulo realized that his mother and Casanova were still seeing each other. Chulo was disappointed that his intervention failed, but he was more frightened at the prospect that his intervention might have made life worse for him at home. At 12 years old Chulo noticed that his father's health took a turn for the worse. His father was sickly and showed signs of dementia. Chulo noticed that his mother continued to use his father for her own convenience. He said his mother and her boyfriend, Casanova, exploited his father to get money for drugs. As Chulo noticed, his mother came around whenever his father's veteran checks were due to arrive. She would clean out the bank account. His mother's actions meant there was hardly any money left to care for him, and he went several days without food. With the diminished abilities of his father, Chulo felt forced to start learning to survive on his own. Having to go out on the streets was like a moment of crisis for Chulo. A concern was that drug dealers and gangbangers in the community would take advantage of his vulnerabilities. At times, his peers bullied him in elementary school, and he became vigilant and defensive in relating to his peers. He recalled that it was difficult to be a Spanish kid who looked black. The black kids would taunt him saying that he was trying to look black, and the Hispanic kids would tease him because of his bald head. On one occasion, in 2005, at age 13, Chulo showed up at St. Barnabas with another head injury. He had been there for one when he was 11, but this time, it was different. He claimed he got jumped, or pummeled, and hit in the head with a golf club. Sometime later, prior to his 14th birthday, Chulo's life took a devastating turn when his father was hospitalized due to a stroke. After his father's hospitalization, Chulo was in the sole custody of his mother, Ramanita. His siblings were also residing with his mother. Chulo felt thrown into a spiral of despair, as his mother was incapable of offering the support, the guidance, and the structure he needed. He was practically homeless by age 13, and the family experienced a lot with ACS. His father stopped supporting him and would shut him out of the house. He also recognized that his mother lacked the commitment to assume sole custody of him, as he entered his teenage years. Accordingly, he was left to his own devices without parental or adult support, supervision, and guidance. Without a stable home, Chulo was forced into the streets. He admits to being confronted by drug dealers, gangs, and other negative influences on the streets. He reported that he started to smoke marijuana when he became homeless, but he did not use hard drugs or sell drugs. He suggested that early memories of his mother's association with drugs haunted him, and he did not want to follow in his mother's footsteps. He would go to the drug dealers and beg them not to sell drugs to his mother. He'd cry, but they still would sell to her. He drifted in and out of his mother's residence. At the same time, he tried to cultivate relationships with sympathetic individuals as alternatives to his parents. 
Chulo related that some of the storekeepers took pity on him and gave him temporary shelter sometimes. Many times, however, he was forced to sleep in abandoned buildings or on rooftops. He recalled a building he frequented at or near 180th and Arthur Avenue, where the neighbors invited him in to take a shower sometimes. In the winter months, he would stay by a friend of his mother's. Living on rooftops, abandoned buildings and the streets left Chulo at increased risks of physical harm. The longer he spent on the street the more ragged and vulnerable he appeared. He was teased and assaulted because of his ragged appearance and his lack of shelter. Guys told him he was stink. Furthermore, the risk of bodily harm would escalate whenever his antagonists believed he lacked protection. Chulo indicated that various incidents tested his ability to refrain from delinquency. These incidents include being robbed repeatedly of money he earned and threats by gang members. According to Chulo, he saved his money to buy clothes to improve his appearance, but other youth stole from him. He also recalls the risks he faced whenever he tried to foster relationships with girls his age. As a teenager, Chulo felt that interacting with girls in school or on the street would bestow a semblance of normality to his life. He discovered, however, that talking to certain girls put him at jeopardy with gang members in his community. He had to learn to defend himself because of the numerous times he was assaulted. He had been bullied since elementary school and so he became defensive around his peers in school. He recalls that when he started high school, incidents of bullying in school decreased. Nonetheless, Chulo's enrollment in high school coincided with a time he was trying to survive on the street, which contributed to his frequent absences. The anxiety he felt in school was transferred increasingly to encounters associated with a hostile street environment. When he was 14 to 15 years old, an older man offered him a place to stay. This man reportedly invited Chulo to live with him and his family on the basis that Chulo helped with the physical maintenance of the house. He jumped at the guy's offer as he was desperate for a chance of stability. Therefore, he was disappointed when he realized that Lou's home was not as stable as Lou made it seem. The behavior of Lou's wife was especially disturbing for Chulo as her actions appeared sexually suggestive. For instance, she would parade in front of him in her underwear. It felt like she was flirting with me, Chulo said. He wondered if she was trying to get him trouble with the man. After a while, he felt so uncomfortable that he left the man's home. When he left, Chulo returned to his mother. His mother was still using drugs, but he felt she was trying to change. He added that his mother appeared functional as she was working a steady job. Not long after he moved in with his mother, old conflicts re-emerged. She brought guys into the home that she met on the streets. These guys were crackheads. He and his mother had several arguments because of the strange men she brought home. This situation was so distressing for him that he again looked outside for alternatives to living with his mother. One alternative that he stated he was strongly resistant to was that of joining a gang. His father, who raised him like he was in the military, imbued in him the fallacy of gang affiliation. He said that his father was a loner and would often tell him that he should stay away from gangs and furthermore, that all a man ever needs is his mind. People will respect you more when you're by yourself, his father would drill into his mind. By 16 he would have his first child and go on to have another by age 18. Although Chulo was proud to be a father, he lacked the maturity, emotional stability, and the financial resources to support his children as he would have liked. The difficulties with his mother, for instance, were so pervasive that they continued to hinder him, despite his efforts to build a life with his new family. They too, would have their own run-ins with the likes of ACS as young parents. Not to the caliber of what Chulo's parents went through though. So now, here we are. Now we will talk of the crimes. A man named Roach was one of the guys who intermingled with both gangs. He testified in this case, but we have to take some things with a grain of salt, as it contradicts some of the things in the Chulo part of the story. Roach moved to the Bronx from Brentwood, Long Island around the early 2000s. It was there that the lure of the streets and quick money seduced Roach. What began as an innocent working-class childhood in suburbia, complete with trick-or-treating on the block and presents under the tree Christmas morning, turned into packaging and hustling drugs on the street. Fast money, girls and a misplaced adolescent loyalty landed Roach the nickname Roach. Not only because of his diminutive stature, but because of his being into everything lifestyle. To be sure, Roach is extremely sociable, likable and friendly. 
It is easy to understand how he was able to slip in and out and between the two warring gangs, the Arthur Avenue crew and the Hughes Avenue crew. Roach Roach testified that, beginning in approximately 2005, he sold crack and cocaine with Chulo on the Arthur Avenue block. This wowed make Chulo about 13 at the time, contrary to when Chulo claimed he himself started selling drugs. Roach explained that, over a period of several years until Roach was incarcerated he and Chulo sold between 40 and 50 bags of crack and cocaine every day. By 2010 there were at least two shootouts and at the time, Roach was selling flow heroin. In 2012, Chulo, 20 years old at the time, recruited Nate, who was 14 years old at the time, to join the Arthur Avenue crew. Torres, who also testified for the government at trial, explained that Chulo provided packs of cocaine. Torres sold these packs nearly every day on the Arthur Avenue block and gave the majority of the proceeds to Chulo. Chulo left the Bronx on a federal drug charge in 2013 and was gone for approximately two years. When Chulo returned to the Bronx in summer 2015, he resumed selling crack and powder cocaine with Roach, Torres, and other members of the Arthur Avenue crew. Chulo obtained his cocaine from Roach and other suppliers. Around August 2015, Roach provided Chulo with 20 grams of cocaine once or twice per week. Roach, Chulo, Torres, and other members of the Arthur Avenue crew sold about half of what Roach provided. Chulo cooked the other half into crack in an apartment in a building located at 2070 Arthur Avenue, which Chulo used as a stash location. Chulo, Roach, and Torres sold the crack for $10 per bag to addicts on the street, including individuals who were receiving treatment at a drug rehabilitation facility located several blocks away. Allegedly, Chulo stored a 357 Magnum in the stash house, and Chulo also carried a 9mm pistol on him, in case there was drama. They were at war with the people from Hughes, just two blocks away, and there was a lot of back and forth shooting, so guns were needed for protection. Chulo and the Arthur Avenue crew competed with the Hughes Avenue crew for the same customers. As a result, tensions developed between Chulo and members of the Hughes Avenue crew, which played out in violent shootouts, even before the shootings charged in the indictment. One of the members of the Hughes Avenue crew was David Rivera, who became an enemy and target of Chulo. Roach testified that in approximately 2010, he observed Chulo shoot Rivera after Chulo saw Rivera while walking down the street. In 2013, several months after members of the Hughes Avenue crew shot at members of the Arthur Avenue crew, Chulo instructed Torres to shoot at a Hughes member, after Chulo spotted the individual walking down the street. In 2015, again at Chulo's instruction, Torres shot at the car of a different member of the Hughes Avenue crew. This competition which Torres described as a drug war, played out in at least three non-fatal shootings between the groups in October and November 2015, and ended with the murder of David Rivera. Sometime in October of that year, allegedly, Chulo went to Hughes Avenue. He spoke with another man named Pippi. Pippi is the younger brother of Jose, the leader of Hughes. Jose was locked up at this time, and so was Jose's brother, John. Their sister, Cheka, was the only one outside out of the lieutenants in the flow organization, excluding Raman. Anyway, Chulo walks up to Pippi to talk about whatever beef or misunderstandings was going on. It seemed pretty mutual, as if nothing was going to come of the situation. Allegedly, the men parted ways. When Chulo was a distance away, he looked back and seen Pippi, now standing next to another guy, David, whom Chulo had beef with. He began shooting towards them. It said that David was shooting back. During this time, Cheka spoke to John who was locked up. John expressed to Cheka that she must take care of Chulo, or else he will keep coming over to the neighborhood shooting. John didn't care too much for people on Hughes Avenue, but he knew that Pippi was always out there and could potentially get caught up in the shootings. The next week, that's exactly what would happen. October 31, 2015. On that day, Torres told Chulo he was going to talk to members of the Hughes Avenue crew because several members had jumped Torres's brother several weeks earlier. Chulo instructed him to get the 357 from the stash house, which Torres did, and then Chulo and Torres proceeded to the Hughes Avenue block. Chulo acted as a lookout. As Chulo and Torres approached the Hughes Avenue block, one of the members, who would be Pippi, shot at Torres. Torres shot back and hit Pippi in the back. Chulo and Torres then returned to the Arthur Avenue block. The shot was three inches from Pippi's spine, almost resulting in him being paralyzed. 
the next day, November 1, 2015 and in retaliation for the October 31 shooting several members of the Hughes Avenue crew, including Cheka, who drove, and David Rivera, went to the Arthur Avenue block. There, they fired shots at Chulo and Torres, as they were standing in front of the stash house. Chulo responded by yelling, you can't F with me, I'm from Arthur Avenue. Torres testified that he and Chulo ran to the roof of the building, and Torres who had retrieved the gun from the stash house on the way up fired shots at the street toward Rivera. Later that day, law enforcement recovered a bullet from a tree in front of the elementary school across the street from the stash house. The very next day, students at that school were forced to sit through an emergency lockdown procedure, while law enforcement officers and school officials ensured that the area was safe. That's what law enforcement did that day, and Chulo shot another member of the Hughes Avenue crew on Tremont Avenue. Tremont is in the same area. Roach testified that he was driving with Chulo when Chulo spotted an individual and told Roach that's one of the new members from the Hughes crew. Chulo got out of the car, and Roach and another witness heard gunfire, a bullet went through the individual's hand. After the shootings, Torres and Roach moved their stash location to a different building about five blocks from the Arthur Avenue block. They were hiding out from the Hughes Avenue crew and the cops, because there was a lot of tension. In the coming days, they shut down the operation. On the morning of November 24, 2015, Chulo, Torres, and another individual were walking away from their new stash location when they spotted Rivera a block or two away. This happened in the vicinity of the Murphy houses. Upon seeing Rivera, Chulo crouched behind a car and cocked the 9mm pistol that Chulo had been carrying. According to Torres, he told Chulo to leave it alone to which Chulo responded. No, he came and shot at us on the block. Torres and Chulo then approached Rivera, who looked back, saw Chulo with a gun, and started running away. Chulo chased Rivera, with Torres following. In addition to Torres, two independent eyewitnesses who identified Chulo as the shooter in photo arrays, and, for one witness, in court, testified as to what happened next, which was also captured on surveillance video. Chulo caught up to Rivera in a parking lot and shot him several times, eventually causing Rivera to fall. One of the eyewitnesses testified that, as Chulo did so, he said to Rivera, Oh, you remember. As Rivera attempted to stand back up, Torres punched him to the ground. Chulo then shot Rivera again, and Rivera did not move. Rivera was shot eight times through the back, hand, chest, and thigh and that the shot that killed him passed through his heart. After the murder, Chulo and Torres ran back to the homeless shelter where Chulo was living with his girlfriend and children at the time. Chulo changed his clothes and instructed Torres to change his jacket and sneakers, and Chulo gave his girlfriend the gun he used to murder Rivera. Ballistics evidence recovered from the scene confirmed that the firearm used to murder David Rivera was the same one used to shoot the guy on Tremont. Cheka and Cruz vowed to get revenge on Chulo, but they would be arrested before they got a chance to retaliate. Meanwhile, Chulo was still on the streets. It did not take long for law enforcement to learn that Chulo had committed the November 24 homicide. When video of the murder confirmed that he was the shooter, the New York City Police Department initiated a citywide search. Chulo was considered the Bronx's public enemy number one. But being the Bronx's most wanted man did not deter the defendant from continuing his violent rampage. On December 31, 2015, and in broad daylight, he committed another shooting on the corner of Elwood Avenue and 196th Street in Manhattan. Chulo and his co-D, Alex, were driving in a van in northern Manhattan when they observed an individual walking down the street carrying two bags. Chulo exited the van, approached the victim, and pointed a firearm at the victim. Chulo then forced the victim to sit down and empty his pockets. The victim reached for Chulo's gun, and Chulo shot the victim in the shoulder. Chulo grabbed the victim's bags and ran away. Video evidence revealed that, on the night before the December 31 shooting, Chulo and Alex had driven past Elwood Avenue and 196th Street, the location of the December 31 shooting, presumably to case the area. The charges and trial on November 27, 2015, Chulo was charged by complaint with the murder of David Rivera. He was arrested on January 12, 2016. And would ultimately get 75 years. Cheka would get 240 months for her participation in the Flow organization. Raman received 300 months, John received 84 months, and Jose received life in prison. But this about wraps is up for this part of the story. We will be doing a part 2 in the future. Remember to sign up for Patreon for the uncut version of certain videos we produce. 
but as always, stay low, and thanks for watching.